everyone, it's Sarah Threadster, Nurse RN.com, and in this video, we're going to be going over truncus arteriosus. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over pediatric nursing. And as always, after you watch this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. Truncus arteriosus is a congenital heart defect where there is one artery that is shared and actually arises out of the right and left ventricle. Now normally this isn't how your heart should be set up. You should have two separate arteries that really do their own thing, not one that is shared. So what are those arteries? First of all, we have the pulmonary artery and it comes out of the right ventricle. Now the right ventricle takes deoxygenated blood that is exhausted, that just went through the body. It's going to take that blood through the pulmonary artery and go to the lungs to become oxygenated. The other artery we have is the aorta. And the aorta comes off of the left ventricle normally, and it carries nice, rich, oxygenated blood that has just really came from the lungs. And it's gonna take that blood and it's gonna pump it all through your body. Because in order for your tissues, your organs, your brain, everything to work, it has to receive nice, pure, fresh, oxygenated blood. It can't receive a mixture of deoxygenated blood. Now, these two arteries will have their own valves. The pulmonary artery is going to have the pulmonic valve, and the aorta is going to have the aortic valve. And what those valves do is they set within those regions and they open and close as those ventricles, either the right and left ventricle, pumps blood up through the body and it allows the blood to flow through either the aorta or or the pulmonary artery. However, in truncus arteriosus, those valves are not present. They will usually have only one valve present in this big artery, and it's known as a truncal valve, and it's not really the greatest valve. Now, in addition with this congenital heart defect, there is usually another type of congenital heart defect present in this condition. It's very rare for it not to be present. And it's called a VSD, which is a ventricular septal defect. In our other lectures, we talked in depth about VSDs. So if you are studying congenital heart defects, be sure to watch that video as well. Now, what is that? Well, right here, separating your right and left ventricle, you have a septum. Well, in a VSD, there's a hole in that septum. And what can happen is it allows blood to mix. And that's what's happening here. So we will have usually a hole in between the septum. It's gonna take deoxygenated blood that's on the right side, oxygenated blood on the left side, and it's gonna mix. And in a sense, it's gonna create like this purplish blood. So this blood's gonna go up through that truncal valve. It's gonna go up through the truncal artery. And some of that blood's gonna to go to the pulmonary artery, which majority of it does. And and some of it's gonna go through the aorta. Now that's not good because your body doesn't want a mixture of blood. It wants fresh oxygenated blood. And here in a moment when we go over the path though, you're gonna see why that's a problem with this condition and why children need immediate treatment. But first let's talk about what is the truncus arteriosus. This is actually a real structure that's naturally in an embryo during development. So it's an embryonic structure that normally starts out as one structure, but later on during development, it should divide into two structures, your pulmonary artery and your aorta. However, in this heart defect, that absolutely fails to happen, and that is why we have this condition. Now, how common is this heart defect? Well, it's relatively rare, and according to cdc.gov, there's about 300 cases per year in the U.S., and most cases are due to a genetic disorder called DiGeorge syndrome. And this is where chromosome 22 is missing. Now, according to CS Mott's Children's Hospital, about 33% of babies with truncus arteriosus do have DiGeorge syndrome. Now let's switch gears and let's talk about the pathophysiology of this condition. And to do that, we first have to talk about the normal blood flow through a normal structured heart. So here's a heart that does not have truncus arteriosus. And we 
can tell that by that nice pulmonary artery coming off that right ventricle that's represented in blue and then you have another artery that is the aorta and it comes off the left ventricle now when we're talking about blood flow everything is going to start on the right side of the heart so blood that is unoxygenated it's blue blood in a sense it's going to flow in through the superior and the inferior vena cava and that deoxygenated blood is going to go into the right atrium then the right atrium is going to allow it to flow through the tricuspid valve down to the right ventricle then the right ventricle is going to squeeze that blood up through the pulmonic valve then the pulmonary artery and then that blood is going to go to the lungs gas exchange is going to occur now it's not blue anymore it's red blood because it's rich in oxygen and it's going to flow back into the heart through the pulmonary vein then the blood's going to go into the left atrium down through the mitral or bicuspid valve you can call whatever you want then into the left ventricle the left ventricle is very strong it's going to squeeze that blood up through the aortic valve into the aorta and then the aorta branches off into the, all these arteries and all that blood's going to go throughout the body. But in this condition we have blood mixing issues and we have over circulation of blood particularly to the lungs. So let's analyze it and look at it. Okay here we have a heart we have a shared artery that truncus arteriosus and it's like hovering over that right and left ventricle. Now, normally in this heart defect, it's super rare. They are going to have another heart defect, like I said before, the VSC. So the hole in this ventricular septum. And this is going to allow blood that's came in from this right side, that's blue blood, deoxygenated, and blood on that left side that's red, it's oxygenated, to mix together and create this like purplish blood that's really low in oxygen. So that blood is going to travel up through that shared artery and some of the blood is going to go up through the aorta and go to the body. Well, as I pointed out earlier, the body doesn't like blood that's low in oxygen. And this is going to lead to cyanosis in that infant. They can have a bluish colored skin and that's from low oxygen content to the blood. Organs are going to suffer, doesn't really cause a great condition for survival of life. Now, also what's going to happen is majority of that blood that's coming up through this truncal artery is going to go to the lungs. Now, why is majority of the blood going to the lungs rather than through the aorta? Well, when that infant is born and it starts breathing on its own, the pressure lowers to pulmonary circulation than to systemic circulation. So in other words, it's easier for this heart to pump blood to the lungs because it has a lower pressure than through that aorta, which is to systemic circulation. So, ma so majority of it's gonna flow to our lungs. Now that is really what's gonna cause a lot of our problems and our signs and symptoms. So you have over-circulation of blood to the lungs, that is going to, over time, damage the arteries that feed the lungs. Now, whenever we have narrowing of the arteries, of any artery in the body, what happens? We get hypertension, we increase the pressure in there. So you're gonna get pulmonary hypertension. Now this is going to, in turn, affect our heart. And what it's gonna do is you have this heart that's having to pump against this, but if you increase the pressure, the pulmonary hypertension, it's going to increase the resistance that this heart has to pump to, which in the end, it's going to wear out and you're going to get heart failure. So a lot of times these infants can enter into heart failure within like the first week of life. And in addition, there's going to be even less blood that's going to go to the lungs that's going to become oxygenated. So you're going to further complicate the oxygenation status of this infant. So now let's talk about the signs and the symptoms that can occur in this condition. Okay, we just analyzed the pathophysiology for this condition. So whenever you're taking an exam and you're trying to recall the signs and the symptoms, 
Think about that path though, because if you can remember those key concepts of what is going on in this condition, there's no need to memorize the signs and the symptoms. They sort of all just fall together. And then you can pull off your nursing interventions for that patient, medications, things you have to watch out for. That's why I really like to concentrate on that pathophysiology. Okay, so what did we say was going on? First of all, we have this deoxygenated blood. It's the mixture of blood that is low in oxygen going to the systemic circulation through the aorta. Because remember, some of that blood's going to the aorta, but most of it is going to the pulmonary artery. Well, that's gonna lead to one of our signs and symptoms, cyanosis, that bluish coloring of the skin, and that's from low oxygen in the blood. Stems back from that. Now, because we have low oxygen in the blood, uh, blood, the body tries to compensate for that and make that infant breathe faster because breathing faster can take in more oxygen and increase the level. That's what the body thinks. So you can see an increased respiratory rate in these babies. In addition, another thing that was going on that we talked about was heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. The pulmonary hypertension is going to lead to that heart failure because that heart cannot pump against that high pressure in that those lungs any longer because the lungs, the, narrow, the arteries that feed the lungs have narrowed. Now that heart has to squeeze even harder to get that blood there. So in the long run, it's going to lead to even less blood going to the lungs. So what can happen is whenever your baby does go into heart failure, and again, it can sometimes happen as quick as the first seven days of life, that baby is going to be extremely lethargic, or fatigued, and it, this is because they have low cardiac output. So because they're tired and fatigued, what do babies do a lot that they're probably not gonna do because they're so tired? Feed. So they're gonna have poor feeding, which is going to equal poor weight gain. They're not gonna put on weight from the milk that they're taking in because they're not really taking any in. Now, you have the low cardiac out output, so you also wanna be thinking about activity intolerance. So when we're thinking nursing realm, we're thinking about our diagnosis for our care plan, activity intolerance. We think about nutrition issues like imbalance nutrition. We can think about ineffective breathing pattern because of that low oxygen level. In addition, they can have this diaphoresis, which is like sweating, a cold, clammy sweat from where they have low cardiac output, especially they can have that during feeding, and they can have the edema where the fluid is starting to back up from where you have a weak heart. Now, when you listen to heart sounds, you may be able to notice a heart murmur, and the type of heart murmur present with this is due to that turbulence of blood flow occurring in this trunkal artery and it's an ejection systolic murmur heard around that left sternal border. So now let's wrap things up and let's talk about nursing interventions. What are we going to be doing for a patient with this heart defect? Okay, first of all, this condition can be diagnosed with a chest x-ray, an EKG, or an echocardiogram, which is most commonly what's used. And that's an ultrasound of the heart. They can look at that, look at the structures and see what's going on. Now, whenever a patient does have this, they're gonna have surgery. And usually the surgery is done within the first two weeks of life. And before surgery, they're gonna be started on some medications because what's a big thing that can happen? Heart failure. So they want to really preserve that heart's function and give them some medications that can help. So let's talk about those medications. One medication is digoxin, diuretics, and then ACE inhibitors. Okay, so for digoxin, you not only want to know this material for pediatric nursing, but also like med surge um, for other classes as well. Dig is a big topic. So with digoxin, you have to measure therapeutic levels and you want to fall within a certain range because there's a high risk of dig toxicity. And you want that range for it to be therapeutic to run between 0.5 to 2 nanograms per milliliter. And anything greater than two up in threes, that is considered digoxin toxicity. So on exams, they're probably going to throw out at you a therapeutic range and you need to know, hey, do I give this medication based on that range or do I hold it? A lot of test questions like to ask that. Now, what are some things that can increase digoxin toxicity? Because that's what we're looking at as the nurse. Well, 
hypokalemia, when that potassium level is too low, that can increase a patient's risk of developing this. So you're gonna be looking at those potassium levels. Doctors will order that, you'll be looking in the chart as it's coming in and seeing what's the patient's potassium level. And if they're on diuretics, like those diuretics that waste potassium, like Lasix, you always wanna be on alert for that. In addition, before we even give digoxin, we have to measure the apical pulse. If you don't know how to do that, I have a video where you can watch that. And there's some parameters of how you would hold the dose depending on what that apical pulse is. So you will check the apical pulse for one full minute. And if it's an adult, less than 60 you would hold. For a child, less than 70 you would hold. For an infant, less than 90 to 100 beats, whatever your institution has, follow that, but that's usually the parameters. Now in an infant, they can't tell you and communicate with you, hey, something's going on. So you have to watch for those subtle signs and symptoms. All of a sudden throwing up, vomiting is a telltale sign and symptom of ditch toxicity in an infant or some type of dysrhythmia that has just popped up. In addition, you really wanna watch that renal function so the body can be able to clear the drug. We don't want it to accumulate. So you're gonna be monitoring their intake, their output. Are they not putting out a lot of urine, but they're taking all this in? That could be a sign that, hey, renal function's going down. And the antidote for digoxin is digibine. Another type of medication that can be used is called diuretics. And there is various types of diuretics that act on certain parts of that nephron in the kidney. And what diuretics do is they cause the body to rid itself of extra fluid. So a lot of times whenever you have a heart that's susceptible to heart failure, you can have where fluid's starting to build up from where that heart isn't pumping efficiently. So you can give them diuretic and they will urinate out that extra fluid. But because they're doing that, you can throw them into some fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So as a nurse, you wanna be watching out for that, looking at their labs, looking at any telltale signs and symptoms of a fluid and electrolyte imbalance, looking at that EKG. And I have a whole series on fluid and electrolytes if you want to watch that series to help you for NCLEX as well. And whenever we're looking at that, we're really watching our potassium level if they're taking digoxin, as I pointed out earlier. Because again, what does digoxin do? It helps the heart be at a slower rate, but have stronger contractions. And if we're throwing diuretics on top of that and they drop their potassium level, it can increase dig toxicity. Also, you wanna be looking at their I's and O's. A lot of diuretics can be hard on the kidneys, can hurt kidney function. So we wanna make sure that they're putting out the appropriate amount of urine based on what they need to put out for their age category. Another type of medication used are called ACE inhibitors. Drug that's an ACE inhibitor is captopril. A lot of these ACE inhibitors end in P-R-I-L. So um, to help you if you're looking at an exam, which one's an ACE inhibitor, try to look for that. What these medications do is they decrease afterload. So whenever you decrease afterload in the heart, it makes it easier for the heart to pump blood to the body. And it will improve the actual amount the heart uh, the actual amount of blood that the heart is pumping and it will decrease that effort that heart has to take to pump the blood. So those are the medications that a lot of times are gonna be used before surgery. They may be on them for a short time after surgery as well, and that's just to help their heart function. So some other nursing interventions we wanna be thinking about is nutrition, of course. So these infants are gonna be probably on some supplements to help with uh, calories. Also, they may have a feeding tube to help with feeding because they're just gonna be so tired, not really want to eat. You're gonna be monitoring their weights. Are they gaining weight? Infants should be gaining weight as they're taking in calories. That's the big thing you wanna watch with them. Listening to their lung sounds. Is that heart getting so weak? Fluids backing up into her lungs. Are we hearing crackles? Are their lungs wet? Look at that potassium level again. If they're on ditch. And oxygen status. How does their skin color look? Because remember, we have some 
blood mixing problems. Now let's talk about surgery. Okay, surgery usually occurs within that first two weeks of life. And what they're gonna do is they're going to close that VSD with a patch so there's no longer a connection between the right and left ventricle. Then they're gonna take those pulmonary arteries and separate them from that truncal artery and put them where they're supposed to go. So it's gonna connect the pulmonary artery to the right ventricle via a valve conduit. Now, whenever that occurs, you wanna be educating the family that after surgery, they'll have to be monitored by the cardiologist, making sure everything's looking good with that conduit because they may need more procedures later on because that conduit can narrow. And um, as that infant grows into a child, they can outgrow the conduit. So keep that in mind. In addition, they may be on prophylactic antibiotics to prevent bacterial endocarditis that can occur as well. Okay, so that wraps up this review over truncus arteriosus. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.